Hello art friends, my name is Fleshwad and welcome to the channel. Today I'm going to be reading two horror stories based upon the cryptid creation Siren Head, created by Trevor Henderson. I will of course leave all of his links down below, as well as the links of the stories I'm going to read in this video. Make sure to watch this video in the dark with the lights off and your headphones on for the best viewing experience. The Siren Head, posted by u slash Darth Kev 696. Just imagine you're living in a rural town that was evacuated days ago due to reasons you aren't yet aware of. You ride your bike to a nearby gas station trying to take advantage of the absence of people. It's 1am and the stars aren't even visible because of light pollution. Everything around you is still and silent, as if time itself had stopped. No crickets chirping, no birds whistling, no cars driving. You arrive at the gas station after a 12 minute bike ride, and it's conveniently but unsettlingly empty. Despite intending to take everything you could, you were kind of hoping to find someone behind the register, someone to talk to. You grab everything you can and stuff it into your pockets and backpack. You exit the station and suddenly hear the faint sound of a siren. You freeze. You calm yourself saying, it's just the evacuation siren again, but you know it can't be, because the siren it would be coming from is on a pole right in front of you. To your relief and dismay, the siren abruptly stops, leaving you in total silence. You begin riding back home. Six minutes into the ride back, siren sound once again returns, only this time much, much louder. The shock of the noise freezes you in your tracks. You fall off of your bike, frozen with shock. You hate the fact that you react this way. You always imagined yourself running when in uncertain or terrifying circumstances. But alas, you freeze there. You hear treetops rustling like bushes twigs and branches, snapping violently off of them. Finally, you snap out of it and begin running home, the siren getting deafeningly louder with each passing second. Your heart is hastily pounding against the walls of your chest. You don't even know what the hell you're running from. You sprint past an abandoned car, and in the faint reflection, in its dusty, shattered side view mirror, you see it, an unimaginably tall being, with mummy-like skin, small veins poking throughout. It smells like death. It's covered in flies. It has two sirens in place of a head. You yell every expletive you know. You run faster. All you can hear is its blaring sirens and the ringing of your ears. You're running at your fastest achievable speed, but every step it takes is equivalent to 10 for you. It reaches forward and grabs you by the neck with its cold, flaky hands. And you scream into the starless, unforgiving night. It lifts you up to one of its sirens. It's full of dull, crimson-stained teeth. You try to let out one last scream, but it tightens its grip. You close your eyes and feel the worst pain and anger you've ever experienced. Then, nothing.
If you hear a siren, don't go outside. Posted by you slash irresponsible Gaijin. I awoke to the sound of a police car siren while traveling in Japan last summer. The siren wasn't overly loud, but loud enough to wake me up. It didn't grow closer nor distant, as if the siren, whatever its origin, was from something stationary. Without getting out of bed, I reached for the curtain of my hotel bedroom window and groggily pulled it towards me, revealing it was still dark outside. I had tried to see some of rural Japan, away from Tokyo, and what I soon realized was the low season, staying in hotels and hostels with little to no guests. That night, I was sure I was the only person in the hotel as the owner had gone home, and I didn't see anyone else there. I remember thinking it was quite spooky when brushing my teeth and walking back to my room through a deserted corridor. These small towns I found myself in were quiet, dilapidated, and sparse, thanks to population decline. A far cry from towns in the UK, which I grew up in, with their tightly packed terraced houses, traffic jams, and police car sirens that sounded every night. Responding to stabbings we'd read about in the next day's local news. Hearing a police car siren was so trivial. I lay my head back on the pillow without thinking much of it. Although crimes are rare in quiet towns such as these, they still happen occasionally. In any moment, I thought. I'd see red lights flash onto the room's faded wallpaper as a black and white police car speeds by. I waited, but no such lights appeared, and I found myself becoming increasingly agitated, unable to figure out a reason. Why was I so agitated by the sound of a police car siren? Had I committed a crime and somehow forgotten about it? Then I realized the siren sound wasn't of a Japanese police car. It was from a British police car. Different countries' emergency vehicles have different sirens, and I was amused upon first hearing a Japanese police car a few days earlier. It sounded just like they do in anime, thinking it was strange to hear a British police siren in rural Japan. I stood up and looked out the window concentrating to see into the darkness. Staying in smaller towns and cities, I'd realized, unsettlingly, street lighting is as scattered as the people who live there and often non-existent. Sometimes after dark, the only light source is a lone vending machine in a bus stop that's used twice a day. It was an eeriness I'd never grown accustomed to in my time there. But outside the hotel, Far down the road was a flickering streetlight by a junction in the road, and further still I saw the outline of the area's tsunami warning system, a metal tower like a mobile phone mast, with the megaphones atop facing every direction to warn of incoming tsunamis. Another trait of Japanese towns which isn't found in the UK. I'd walked past it during daytime on my way to the hotel without paying much attention to it. Having seen identical structures in towns I'd visited previously, I remember the sight of rust showing through its grey paintwork and not much else. I wondered if that could be the source of the sound, but why would it play the sound of a British police car and so late at night? The streetlight flickered off, for a moment I saw only blackness, until the light was back and the tsunami warning tower was closer. I blinked, thinking I must be mistaken. It was late at night and I don't always perceive things correctly when tired, but the siren was just slightly louder than it had been a moment before. I stared out the window into the night, then slowly the tower, or what I thought was a tower, stepped towards me. A skinny leg twisted from its metal framework structure, lifting and planting into the road before the rest of its lanky body repeated the same contorting movements on the other side. 
The upper body unfurled grotesquely, forwards and backwards with each stride. Due to its slenderness, it moved like it weighed nothing. I watched it take four steps towards me, unable to believe what I was seeing, until I was overcome by fear. I knew it was coming for me specifically. I was probably the only British person for miles and yet chose to play a sound common in the UK. As it moved by the streetlight, I caught glimpses of the rusty surface, only then realizing it wasn't rust. It was flesh. Finally believing what I was seeing, I hid in the first place I could see, which happened to be under a wooden table by the window. The siren grew louder and louder. It echoed throughout the room until stopping suddenly, an eerie silence in its place. I felt my heart thumping in my chest, in my ears, and I tried to breathe as slowly as I could to make as little noise as possible. I felt as though something were outside, looking into the window. I stayed still, not daring to look. The silence was soon broken by a tap on the window, then a drawn out scratch, repeated agonizingly slow for the next few minutes. It sounded powerful enough to easily break the window if it wanted to, as if it wanted me outside, but I wouldn't move. The knocks and scratches continued, slowly, rhythmically. Phrases in Japanese I didn't understand cackled loudly, sounding just like a voice spoken into a megaphone, garbled one after another in lieu of the siren. Among the many words and sentences, I heard one which I finally understood in my rudimentary Japanese. Or, please come, in English. It's a phrase I'd heard in Japanese evening classes I'd taken a few months prior. The voice sounded strangely like my Japanese teacher, though terrifyingly distorted an amalgamation of numerous voices to synthesize the various words. I heard it repeat. The only phrase I understood and somehow it knew to repeat it. That's when I heard a click downstairs, from the hotel's front entrance. It understood how to use doors. I held my breath, knowing the front door is locked at night but I wasn't sure what time. The door shook like an earthquake while I sat still, hunched under the table. I don't know how long this lasted, how long it shook the front door or how long it howled through those megaphones. It eventually stopped as suddenly as it began, but I stayed under the table until long after daylight, too frightened to move. That was the longest night of my life. The sun was high in the sky by the time I crept from under the table and grabbed my phone. After finding the location of the nearest Koban on Google Maps, I left the hotel and headed straight to it. Upon exiting the hotel, I glanced at where the tsunami warning tower had been. It was gone. Then I glanced at my room's window and the building's exterior for signs of damage, but found none. I walked quickly to the Koban, looking over my shoulder frequently as I went. Greeted by a skinny old police officer there and in my best Japanese, also with some help from Google Translate, I told him someone had tried to break into the hotel I was staying in. I chose not to talk about the siren and voices, thinking it would sound too strange to be believed. The police officer, with a regretful look on his face and looking down in a slight bow, told me there was nothing the police could do 
except to run a few patrols past in the coming days and inform the hotel manager, since nothing was damaged or stolen and I couldn't, or wouldn't, describe what the assailant looked like, nor did I call while the incident took place. I silently cursed myself for not bringing my phone under the table with me. About to leave, opting immediately to cut this excursion short and return to Tokyo, I asked if someone had moved the tsunami warning tower. The police officer looked up from the desk, puzzled before his eyes widened. He spoke in that calm voice Japanese people seem to reserve for confusing foreign tourists. We're 60 kilometers from the sea and surrounded by mountains. We don't need a tsunami warning system here. I felt a chill rush down my spine upon hearing those words, leaving at once to grab my things and leave. None of the towns I'd stayed in were near the sea, all within mountainous terrain. Yet all towns had tsunami warning towers. They were everywhere. Then I remember the look the police officer had given when I asked about the tsunami warning tower near the hotel. He knew what I was talking about. I soon hastily packed my backpack and hurried to a desolate train station of a struggling third sector railway, the quickest way out of town. Eventually seeing headlights of an approaching train where two rusty tracks met in the far distance. I stood up, eager to board as soon as possible. As I did, a huge flock of crows ascended suddenly from the trees in the surrounding forests fluttering upwards, as though frightened by something. Then, from where they'd taken off, something grotesquely tall lumbered among the treetops, too far for me to ascertain much detail, but I noticed the silhouetted outline of the megaphones through the branches before my view was obscured by the approaching train. Having since returned home, I thought less and less of that night and what I'd encountered, although my heart still misses a beat whenever I hear the siren of an emergency vehicle, until a couple of weeks ago, when I stumbled on a YouTube video shared in a group chat. The video is titled, Who is Siren Head? I felt dizzy upon noticing the thumbnail. Watching it, I felt my heart thump in the same way it had that night all those months ago. I'm sure what I'd encountered was indeed a siren head. I felt vindicated, knowing I'm not the only person to have been stalked by it, but terrified to know siren head is very much real. Also slightly miffed some illustrators trying to pass it off as his own creation. I'm not sure if there's anything we can do to stop siren head, or any reliable advice I can give, but if you ever hear a siren or megaphone late at night, please don't go outside. And that is the end of our two Siren Head stories. Huge thank you to the authors who let me read their stories, but also a huge thank you to Irresponsible Gajan for helping me out <laughs> in his story. He's the author and he asked if he could help me out um, with some voice work and he killed it. You can find his links in the description, although I do have to warn you he is a not safe for work account. Just a heads up before you click. But yeah, huge thank you. Thank you so much, dude. You killed it. And remember, this cryptid slash character is the creation of artist Trevor Henderson. So please go and give him some love. This guy creates the coolest, scariest artwork. It's amazing. Hope I made your Wednesday a little bit spookier. Thank you so, so much for watching, art friends. Until the next video. Bye.